Hello, and welcome to Lecture 5 of Type Systems. In this lecture, we're going to review what we saw about System F in the previous lecture, and then actually put it to work using what are called church encodings. So, in the previous lecture, we saw what uh, we saw System F, which is sometimes also called the Girard Reynolds polymorphic lambda calculus. And what was that? So the basic idea with the polymorphic lambda calculus is that we add variables to our types so that a single term can now be allowed to have many different types. And so the idea is that we are going to take the simply typed lambda calculus with functions and to that we are going to add type variables. And then in order to uh, um, write terms that have many different types, we introduce the polymorphic type quantifier. So for all alpha, A. And so this means that if you have a term of type for all alpha A, we're allowed to substitute any type we like for the variable alpha. And so our terms are going to be variables, ordinary lambda abstractions, and ordinary applications. And to that, we are going to add two additional type constructors. One, which we call big lambda, are the introduction form for the polymorphic type uh, quantifier. And so if you can see for all alpha A, we say bind the type variable alpha and in the body use the type E, use the expression E. And if you have something of type uh, polymorphic type, you can instantiate that polymorphic type quantifier with the type A. And so because we've added um, variables to our types, we now need two typing contexts. We need a context for the type variables, which we write theta, and we need a context for the term variables, which we will continue writing gamma. And so we now have several judgments. We have a well-formedness judgment for types, which says A is a well-formed type in the type variable context theta, and we have a well-formedness for term contexts, which says that the typing con the, the term variable context gamma is well-formed under the type variables theta, and we have a term typing judgment, which says that given the two contexts theta and gamma, E has the type A. And what we have, uh, so I said on the previous slide that types are well-formed and need to be checked for well-formedness too. And this turns out to be quite easy because essentially all we're doing is we're checking that types are well-scoped. And so that means that whenever we see a type variable alpha, we check that it occurs in the context big theta when we have a, fu a function type A arrow B, we check that both of the co uh, uh, subterms A and B are well typed in theta. And when we che uh, check that for all alpha dot A is well formed, we check that A is well formed in a typing uh, type variable context that's augmented with the variable alpha. So this lets us say that alpha is al allowed to occur inside of big A, but not outside of it. And so this is really just a well-scopedness check. And when we check that the well-formedness of, of a term context, recall that a term variable context is just a list of vari term variables, which we write little x, and their types, big A. And so all we're doing is we're checking that a term context is well formed by checking if every single type that we're ascribing to term variables is also well formed in big theta. And so we need this because the contexts associate variables with types and types now have a well formedness condition. And now that we have these two, uh, these two, uh, judgments, we can actually write down the typing rules. And so again, we saw this in the previous lecture, and most of these rules are unchanged from the simply typed lambda calculus. For variable, for term variables, we check that x colon a occurs in the term variable context gamma. When we check a lambda expression, we 
add the vari term variable to the context, and then we check the body with the one additional wrinkle that we check that the type that we're ascribing to the variable is well formed. And for function applications, we check that the function argument has a function type A or B, and then we check that the argument E prime actually has that type A. And so all of the action in system F occurs in the two new typing rules that we've introduced. So the for all introduction rule uh, uh, says that a big lambda, big lambda alpha dot E is well typed at for all alpha dot B when we add alpha to the context of term variables and check that the body E has the type B. And if we have something of type for all alpha dot B, and we know that A is a well-formed type, we're allowed to do a type application. E uh, we applied to the, uh, to the type A, and the output will have the type A for alpha and B. And so you can note that we're substituting the type A for the variable alpha in the type for all alpha dot B. And so this is where most of the uh, complexity in system F comes from. So it's an innocuous looking rule, but then this forces us to prove a whole bunch of theorems about the uh, interaction of type and term substitution and term typing. So before we get to that, before we recap that though, I want to talk about something new, which is the operational semantics. In the previous lecture, we talked a little bit about the substitution, but we didn't go into much detail. And the reason we want to do, use substitution is in order to give an operational semantics. So the first half of this is the same as it was in the simply typed lambda calculus. Um, we have a congruence rule for applications, which says that if E0 steps to E0 prime, then E0 E1 will have stepped to E0 prime E1. And so that's the first congruence rule for the function position. And if the function position is a value V0 and E1 steps to E1 prime, then the application V0 E1 will step to V0 E1 prime. And so this is the second congruence rule for function applications. And so that leaves us with the final rule, which says if you have lambda x dot e applied to v, then it'll step to v for x in e. And so that's exactly the same as in the simply typed lambda calculus. But we now have one more sort of value. So in, in addition to lambda, lambda terms that abstract over term variables, we also have big lambda expressions which abstract over type variables. And so we have to give a congruence and application rule for these as well, evaluation rule for these as well. So if E steps to E prime, then we know that E A will step to E prime A. And so that's the congruence rule for the for all case. And unlike the term variable case, we don't need a second congruence rule because we don't have any evaluation rules for types. Types are just a shape describing the data and we don't need to reduce them. So once we know that E is a value, so if it's big lambda alpha dot E, we can substitute A for that type variable alpha in the body E. And that's the evaluation rule for the for all type. And so we have two systems of, of reductions which look almost the same. And to prove type safety for this calculus, we're going to have to prove the substitution theorem. And we're going to have to prove the substitution theorem twice, because here we're substituting term variable, term expert, term values for uh, uh, term variables, and over here we're substituting types for type variables. So we we need to introduce a fair amount of additional uh, overhead. And so you saw in the last uh, in the last lecture that we had to improve a whole bunch of administrative lemmas. And again, I want to reassure you that even though it looks like a lot of work, it's really just about keeping track of the free variables and the types. And we have two sorts of free variables, so we have to keep track of it twice. So we just have some uh, bookkeeping to do. So nothing very, very difficult. And so for the type variables, we have to prove weakening, exchange, and substitution. And this will be just like in lecture one, except easier because the grammar of types is simpler. 
And so once we have this, we'll be able to use this as part of type application. So recall that in the syntax, types occur as annotations to lambda abstractions and so and the typing rule says that we have to check that the type annotation is well formed so when we do a substitution we need to do know that substituting well formed types for type variables preserves the type well formedness and then we also need to show that all of the types that occur in a term variable context are also well formed and so what we have to do is we have to know that if gamma is a well-formed context with uh, a free variable alpha and we substitute capital A for that alpha, we get back out a well-formed context. And so this is just lifting the type level uh, structural properties to context. So we're showing that uh, type, uh, type uh, well formedness is preserved even if we have a list of them in a context and so we just do induction over the context well formedness and at each stage we appeal to substitution for types and then finally we'll also need a regularity property for typing which says that if you have a well formed context and a typing judgment then the type that you found uh, for a term, so if we know that E has the type A, then A will actually be a well-formed type. So if type checking succeeds, then it found a well-formed type that the program has. And so then, with all this machinery in place, we can show we can show the usual properties about uh, um, substitution for terms. Um, so, well, sorry, this isn't quite the usual thing. We're substituting, we're still substituting types for type variables, and we showed that it worked for types, and we showed it worked for contexts, and now that we're, we're going to show that it works for terms too. So here we're saying that if gamma is a well-formed context in a context theta alpha, and A is a well-formed type in theta, and we know that E has the type B in a context theta alpha, gamma, then if we substitute A for alpha everywhere in the context, in the term, and in the output type, then we still have a well-formed typing judgment. So this says substitute A for alpha and it'll work on all of the judgments of the system. It'll work for type well-formedness, it'll work for context well-formedness, it'll work for uh, typing of terms. And now we've done this, now we can come back to the to the regular substitution of values for variables or so now we can say okay f this is the same thing we proved in lecture two where we proved type safety for the simply type lambda calculus except we have a bit more syntax we say okay if we have a well-formed term variable context and b is a type then uh, in big theta then we're allowed to add a variable to the context and notice that we had to check that B was well typed before we could insert it into the context um, because we need to maintain this invariant that the context is always, the types occurring in the term variable context are always well formed with respect to big theta. And then we prove exchange and then we prove substitution. So if you have a well formed context with a free variable, with a variable X, and a term of type A and a term E prime of type B that has the free variable X of type A, you can substitute E for X in E prime and everything will still have the type of B. And so one thing to notice is that here, because term variables only occur in terms, we don't need to do an E for X in gamma or in B. So we just replace E for X in E prime because X can't occur in a gamma or B. Okay, and so we've got our two sets of substitution theorems, one for the types and one for the terms, and uh, each one acting on a different uh, context, and we've, assume, we've listed all the well-formedness conditions we need to assume, and we're able to prove that all this, everything goes through just as it did in the simply typed case. And so now we are able to prove Type, uh, type safety via progress and preservation. So we can show that in a closed uh, 
term, uh, E, that has the type A in the empty type variable context or the empty uh, term variable context, then either E is a value or E will step to E prime. And we can also prove type preservation, which says that if, if E has the type A and E steps to E prime, then E prime will still have the type A. So recall that progress and preservation give you type safety. So if you have a term, it, it, it's either done evaluating or it'll take a step. And if it takes a step, it's going to continue being well-typed. And so a well-typed term can only ever execute or reach a final value state. There's no chance for it to get stuck in some impossible inconsistent state. And so that way we know that there won't be any unexpected runtime errors or memory corruption or anything like that. Okay, so how do we prove it? And the answer is exactly the same way as before. We're going to prove progress by induction on the typing derivation E colon A, and we're going to prove preservation not by induction on the typing derivation, but by induction on the evaluation rel relation. Okay, so let's take a look at progress. And in progress, there are really only two new cases. The case for term-level lambdas and term-level applications is exact, goes in exactly the same way as it does in the simply typed lambda calculus. And so the new stuff only occurs for big lambdas and type applications. So if we're looking at type applications, um, if we get a, a typing derivation that says E applied to A has the type uh, A for alpha and B, then our uh, typing derivation is going to have two subderivations, one telling us that A is a well-formed type, and the other telling us that E has the type for all alpha dot B. And because E is a closed term with the type for all alpha dot B, we can use induction on it, and that will tell us that either E steps to some E prime or E is a value. And so we can proceed by cases on four. So in the case that E actually steps to E prime, we can say, well, we can appeal to the congruence rule. So we know E steps to E prime, and we want to show that E applied to A is either a value or going to step. And so we can use the congruence rule to show that it steps. E steps to E prime, so therefore, E A uh, uh, steps to E prime A. On the other hand, if E is a value, then it's a value of the type for all alpha dot B. And the only way you can get a value uh, of type for all alpha dot B is by is if it's of the form big lambda alpha dot E prime. So this is what's called the canonical forms property. We know all the values are either little lambda x dot E or big lambda alpha dot E. And so the only two typing rules that could apply are either the term level lambda or the type level lambda. And since the t we want the type level lambda, that tells us that E must be big lambda alpha dot E prime for some big lambda alpha dot E prime. And if we've got that, now we can use the for all eval rule because the for all eval rule says that if you have big lambda alpha dot E prime applied to A, then it's going to step. It's going to step to A for alpha in E. And so we know that uh, progress has to hold for type applications. And if we want to prove uh, induction on the derivation of uh, uh, of, yeah. So if we want to prove type preservation, we need to do this by induction on the derivation of E steps to E prime. And so there will be two cases. Uh, actually, no, there will only be one case because the uh, um, big lambda is actually a value. And so the only new case that we'll have to consider is the reduction rule for all eval. Um, and, okay, well, there's two cases. There's the congruence and the eval rule, but the congruence case is relatively easy. So the eval rule, will, the for all eval case, will tell us big lambda alpha dot E applied to A steps to A for alpha in E. And in this case, we also know that the type application is well typed. 
And so therefore we know that there's going to, the type output is A for alpha in B for some well-formed type A and some big lambda alpha dot E that has the type for all alpha dot B. And then the only typing rule that applies to this is the big lambda introduction rule. And so therefore we get a subderivation that says E has the type B in the context uh, alpha with the empty term variable context and only the free type variable little alpha. And so therefore by type substitution of this for alpha, we're going to get that A for alpha in E has the type A for alpha in B. And we have just shown that this, that means that the result of the step is well typed. Okay, so one thing that you should do is I've told you, oh yes, several things are relatively routine. You should check that for yourself because, and then compare it to the uh, type safety proof for the simply typed lambda calculus, because that's really the only way you can convince yourself that you're seeing only the important cases on these slides. And once you've done that, you'll be able to see that the proof of type safety for system F is only a little bit harder than the type safety proof for the simply typed lambda calculus. Um, but for that little bit of extra difficulty, we're going to get an awful lot. And the thing that we're going to get is the ability to write church encodings. So one thing you will have noticed is that in the previous lecture, I talked about how, for instance, with the lists, you want to have the ability to have polymorphic functions. So for instance, if you take the, if you want to calculate the length of a list, you don't care what the payload is. It's the same function whether you're computing lists of integers or the length of a list of integers or the length of a list of booleans or the length of a list of functions. It doesn't matter what the payload type is because you're never going to look at it. You're just going to count the number of con cells and return that. Um, and so we said, in order to write these kinds of generic programs, we have to have, um, we have to have polymorphism. And so we've introduced System F to talk about polymorphism, but where did the data go? We've taken it all out. We just have type variables and type polymorphism, and we've got no uh, data at all. And so one of the shocking facts about system F is that it secretly does have data in it. We don't need to put in data explicitly because polymorphism is enough to express data. And so this fact was discovered in 1941 by Alonzo Church. And um, it wasn't just Alonzo Church, it was also his uh, PhD students. Um, and so the idea that he and his students discovered were, was that when you have the lambda calculus, you can actually represent data using functions. And so you should be used to the idea of going the other way around. We can represent computations using data. In fact, we do it all the time. So let me start my text editor here. And I am going to represent a function using data. So the way that this works is the way that this works is watch what I'm typing. I'm going to write define the factorial function as a as a data structure. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to write down the factorial function Okay, and so do you see what I'm doing? The trick is that this is not a factorial function at all. It's a string. My computer has no idea, no ability to interpret it as a computer program unless I start a, uh, a, comp a compiler or interpreter and then compile that into a uh, a machine code object that gets interpreted by the CPU. So now 
this fa this value fact of type intero int, it's not being represented as a string. It's uh, since I'm running the interpreter, it's actually a bytecode, a piece of bytecode that's going to get evaluated by the bytecode interpreter. So there, it's uh, it's evaluating now. And up here, what I've got in code data.ml is a ASCII string. So I'm representing code by a piece of data. So as as I said, we discover we've discovered we've it's obvious that we can represent code using data, and Church and his students' discovery was that you can go the other way around. So his idea was that we use data in order to make choices. So think of a bit. It's either zero or one, and we use it to decide whether to do one thing or the other. So we check if then else that says we look at one bit of data, a Boolean, true or false, and then we execute one piece of code or another piece of code. And so based on our data, so we switch on the data in order to perform different actions. And so he said, well, why don't we encode data as functions which take their different possible actions and then select the right one to execute? So that's a little bit abstract. So let's actually look at it more closely. And he said, okay, so let's look at the Boolean type. That's the simplest church encoding of all. So with a Boolean, we have two values, true and false. And so if you're an assembly programmer, you might think of this as zero or one, one single bit of information. And we can use this single bit of information, this E of type bool, to either execute E prime if E is true, or to execute E double prime if E is false. And so it can, the only way we can use this Boolean is to make a choice, whether to execute E prime or whether to execute E double prime. And so he said, okay, well, if we want to make this choice, then let's define a, toy, a type that switches between two different things. So let's define the Boolean type as a polymorphic type. It says, okay, for any type alpha, give me what to do if it's true, what to do if it's false, and I will return some result. And so what true is, it says, I want big lambda alpha, and give me an X of type little alpha and a Y of type little alpha, and I will return to you the first branch. And for false, I will take an X and a Y, and I will return the second branch. So the encode, so true and false are actually functions that take their if true branch and their if false branch, and they select which one to use. And so that lets us encode if E, then E prime, else E double prime as take the Boolean E and then give it the E prime and give it the E double prime and E will pick which of these two to do. And so how does this work out? So the way that our church encoding of Booleans works is if we have the conditional test, if true, then E prime else E double prime, the way that it will work is it will tell us that we want to apply E prime and E double prime to the encoding of true. Okay, and what is the encoding of true? Well, the encoding of true is something which takes a true branch and a false branch and returns to you the true branch. Okay, so let's do these substitutions. First, we're going to substitute the type A for the type variable alpha, and this is just bookkeeping. It tells us that X and Y have to be of the type A. Okay, and we already know that E prime and E double prime are of the type of, have the share the same type alpha. And so now let's do the substitution. If we substitute E prime for X, we're going to get lambda Y dot E prime. And if we substitute E double prime for Y, then we're gonna get E prime because E prime doesn't actually occur in uh, inside of e, pri uh, e prime. So Y is not free in E prime. So when we substitute E double prime for it, it's gonna disappear. And symmetrically, if we are doing the false branch, we're taking the church encoding of false and we're giving it the two branches to take, E prime and E double prime. And now when we expand out the definition of false, we see that it's a function which takes the type 
the true branch and the false branch and returns the false branch. So now we can do our substitution again. First we substitute the type, then we substitute the true branch, and now we're substitu substituting e prime for x. But x does not incur in the body at all, it's just y. So it goes away, and now we have lambda y dot y applied to e double prime, and lambda y dot y is the identity function, so it's going to be equal to e double prime. And so what we've been able to do is we've been able to show that this church encoding of booleans captures the computational behavior of, of the boolean type. We're able to show that if true, then e prime else e double prime is going to evaluate to e prime. And we've shown that the church encoding of if false, then e prime else e double prime is going to evaluate to e double prime. And so we are able to simulate the reduction behavior of a conditional using nothing but functions. So functions plus polymorphism, and the reason we need polymorphism is because we can do a conditional test at any type. And so because we can do a conditional test at any type, we use some polymorphism, and then we use functions to encode the data. And we can, inter we can interpret even more things. So we've got one bit of data. What if we wanted two bits of data? Let's look for a pair. And the church encoding for a pair is we, we have a, a pair x times y gives you an x value and a y value. And so what we want to do is we're going to encode it as here's what to do. Let's, let's produce an alpha from an x and a y. If you tell me how to produce an alpha from an x and a y, I will give you back an alpha. And so the way that we're going to encode pairing is we're going to say, if we, to build the pair e, e prime, we're going to say, give me a function which takes an x and a y and I'll give you an alpha and I will I will give you the x, which is the e, and I'll give you the, y, uh, e, the second component, the e prime, and you can use it. And so any function, any way of using an x and a y, we can accommodate. And so if we want to produce the first component, we're going to say, give me this function, and then give me a argument that says, give me the x and a y, and I'll only return the x. And for the second, we say, take the pair, and pass it a function, a continuation, which takes the x and the y and returns the y. And so now we'll be able to see how we're able to encode the computational behavior of first and second and pairs. So if we want to take first of a pair, first of e comma e prime, we expect it to give us back e. And let's see how the church encoding does that. So this says, the encoding of first says take the pair expression and then give it a continuation which takes an x and a y and returns an x. And the encoding of a pair says, well, what I want is I want to be a function which takes an x and a y and then apl give, applies e and e prime to that. So it says give me something which uses the two components and I will tell you which two components to use. Okay, so now what we're going to do is now we can do the substitution fun for functions game. We've got a big lambda to make the types work out. And we're going to say that the type of k is going to be x to y to x. And look, here's what our first is. Our, our first continuation is. It says, give, us an, give me an x, give me a y, and I'll give you back the x, which is the first component. And so now let's do that substitution. So we replace k with this uh, expression lambda x y dot x and now we have lambda x y dot x applied to e and e prime. So when we do the substitution first we're going to replace x with e and now we're going to replace y with e prime but what but y does not occur in e so we're left with e. And so for the second we're going to do something very similar. What we're going to do is we are going to expand out the definition of second, which says take that pair and give it a continuation, which takes an x and a y and returns the y. 
And we're going to expand the pair, which says, well, give me a continuation, and I will give that continuation an E and an E prime. And now we can unroll some definitions. So what we can do is we can say, first, replace the type variable alpha with Y. And so now the pair expression wants to take a continuation of the type X to Y to Y. And this is exactly what we're doing. We're taking an X and a Y, and we're returning a Y, which will have the type X to Y to Y. And now we substitute that expression for K, and we get lambda X Y dot Y applied to E and E prime. So when we substitute E for X, we, it disappears because X doesn't occur in lambda X Y dot Y. And, when we, and we're left over with the identity function, lambda y dot y. And so when we substitute e prime for that, we get e prime. And so we've seen that we can simulate the behavior of first, and we can simulate the behavior of second. And now, so now we've, uh, we've got bits and we've got tuples, so we can do any kind of finite data. Is there more we can do? Well, yes, we can do some types as well. So we're just going to just march through all of the all of the types in the simply typed lambda calculus. And so what we can do is we can say, well, when you have a case, uh, a sum type, the case type the case typing rule says, tell me what to do for the left branch and tell me what to do for the right branch. And so a we can represent the type x plus y as the type which says, give me a left branch and give me a y branch, and I will tell you which answer that you got. And so what we can do to represent the left injection is we can say left of e is this big function which says if you give me a left branch and you give me a right branch, well, apply e to the left branch. And similarly, the right tagging says, if you give me the left branch and you give me the right branch, I will, I will apply E to the right branch. And then that means that the case uh, expression, case E, left of X goes to E1, right of Y goes to E2, can be encoded as, here we've got the, the value of some type E, and the left branch is going to be lambda X dot e1 applied to x, and the right branch is going to be lambda y e2. Okay, let's see what happens. Let's see that the reduction actually works the way we expect it to. So if we have case left of e of lx goes to e1, ry goes to e2, then when we expand the definition of case, it says apply the two branches. We've got the lx goes to e1 becomes lambda x dot e1, the ry goes to e2, becomes lambda y dot e2, and we pass both of this, both of these things to left of e. And the left of e is represented as a function which says if you give me a, a left branch and you give me a right branch, I will apply the left branch to e. Okay, so now we can play that game of unrolling reductions. We can substitute z for alpha and we w now want an x arrow z and a y arrow z, which we've got in our lambda x dot e1 and our lambda x dot y dot e2. So now we can do the substitution of lambda x dot e1, and we get lambda x of uh, uh, lambda x dot e1 applied to e, and we apply that to lambda y dot e2. So we substitute again, and it goes away because the y does not occur free in this expression. And now we have lambda x dot e1 applied to e, which reduces to e for x and e1. And that is exactly what this case expression reduces to. So we can simulate the reduction of, uh, of uh, case, case expressions with the reduction of uh, functions and big lambdas using using this church encoding. And the, the right branch, you can imagine, works just the same way. But I want to talk one, about one more thing. So church encodings can't just in, uh, 
interpret the simply the type lambda calculus, they can also interpret all the stuff in system in uh, in system T. So we can even represent natural numbers. So if you remember, we rep uh, we represented natural numbers with zero and successor, and we used natural numbers with an iter construct, which said if e is zero, you get ez, and when it's successor of something, you apply iter to the predecessor, and then you substitute that in for x in e sub x. So we're replacing all of the uh, uh, constructors, successor constructors, with an application of the uh, e sub s expression. So it says run e sub s. Uh, n times and then finish with ez. And so our church encoding is going to be for all alpha, alpha arrow, alpha to alpha to alpha. And you can see that this alpha corresponds to the ez case and the success uh, the the recursion step or step case corresponds to this alpha arrow alpha. And so so what we can do, so you can even see that right here. So when we have the iter, the the first argument to the natural number is going to be ez, and the second argument is going to be lambda x dot es. And so the way we'll make this work is we'll say zero is something which takes the zero branch and the successor branch and just takes the zero branch. And for the successor case, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, if you give me a natural number n and the two branches zero and z and s, we're going to apply s to e alpha z s. So we're going to uh, iterate on e with the z and s branches, and then we'll apply the whole thing to s. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So iter z, z arrow e z, successor of x to e s, is going to expand to z applied to e z in the step case, lambda x dot e s. We substitute the definition of zero, and now we've got this big lambda expression, its type, and ez, and the e step case. And when we do the substitution, we substitute for the type, we substitute for ez, and now we substitute for e s, uh, es for s, and we're left with ez. And that's exactly the reduction rule for iter that we saw um, in the last lecture. And the same thing even works for uh, for iteration. So we su do our substitution again, successor v applied to the ez and the es arguments, unfold the definition of successor. And so now we have successor of e alpha zs applied to x and ez and lambda x es. And now we can do some substitutions. First, the type. Then we substitute ez for z. And now we substitute lambda x dot es for s. And we get the expression lambda x dot es applied to e x e z e, e, e applied to the type x ez and then lambda x dot es. And so now when we do this substitution, what you can notice is that this thing right here is our encoding of iter. Uh, on E, and now we can do the beta reduction and we get iter of E, Z goes to EZ, S of X goes to ES for X in ES, and that's exactly the reduction rule for iteration. So that's really quite remarkable. We can even uh, do the encoding of iteration in system F. So we've got iteration, we've got sums, we've got products, we could even do lists. And lists are almost exactly the same as natural numbers. So now we have a, uh, a fold operation which tells us what to do in the nil case, and it says how to calculate the a cons case from the, the head of the list and the recursion on the tail. And so we say here's what we do with the nil case, so you can see that en, and here's how we handle the cons case. So, so here's the head, our recursive result on the tail, and here's our new recursive result. And if we know how to do that, we can iterate over a list to produce an alpha. And in the empty list case, we say, well, if you tell me what to do in the nil case and what to do in the cons case, just return the nil case, because this is the empty list. 
And to represent a cons, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, if you tell me what to do in the nil case and what to do in the cons case, I'm going to take what to do in the cons case, give it that value of type x, and then recur on the tail. Okay, and so with these two encodings, what we're able to do is we're able to say, if you give me some something of the church encoding for the list type, I'll tell you what to do with the nil case, and I'll tell you what to do with the cons case, and then the, com the function representing the list can stitch up these uh, branches together in order to calculate the right value. And you should try that the try that to check that the uh, reduction beta reductions for nil and cons work the way that you expect for yourself and then you'll see that system f is an extremely self simple calculus that's also extremely expressive and it's used as the formal basis of polymorphism in practically every programming language with generic types ml java haskell and we all and furthermore we have this amazing theoretical result that the that just from polymorphism and functions data is definable so if you study system f you are also implicitly studying a programming language with nearly as rich data as you can imagine okay and thank you very much